That's how we own it. What's up, family? It's your girl, Tamika D. Mallory. And it's your boy, my son, the general. And we are your hosts of Street Politicians, the, the place, place where, where the streets, streets and, and politics meet. meet. There is the most heat wave ever going on in New York the City. I don't know. The most heat wave ever. The most heat wave ever. Like I had to, I called my parents and told them, abort mission. Don't go outside at all. Okay, where are they planning on going? It's too hot. Yeah, they got God got the heat on hell, man. <laughs> <laughs> the heat is on hell there, man. And it's everywhere. But you know, it's so funny because uh all of these folks, and I'm not gonna say which party they belong to, which political party they belong to, but there are many people in a particular political party that do not believe that climate change is a thing, right? Right? They don't believe in it. And global warming, if you will. And it's crazy because the other day. I was traveling from New York City to New Jersey um, and the rain came. Like as I was leaving the house, oh, I noticed, yeah, no, I noticed that it was about to rain, but you know, I'm a good driver. So I wasn't worried about it. So I get in the car, start driving and eventually the rain starts coming down. When I tell you, the storm was like nothing I have been in. And I have been driving now for who, however many years, 20 years. I have been through, we, you know, storms, traveling, everything. I've never in my life drove through a storm the way that this one was. Water was coming on the bridge. And the reason why I mentioned I was going from New York to New Jersey, you know, you got to cross the George Washington Bridge, unless you take other routes, but the George Washington Bridge is the major artery. And the water was coming off the sides of the bridge onto the cars. So that means that the tide was so high, the water was up so high that it was able to splash back and forth on each side. Then getting through, like through the bridge, you know, you go through a tunnel. So when you get in the tunnel, obviously the tunnel is all the water around it. There must be holes. I don't know what was going on. The water was splashing, was coming. It was pouring out of the tunnel and out of the walls onto the vehicles. So the water was coming like in from the sides. And in order to get to the George Washington Bridge, there's this particular area in the city, it's like in Washington Heights, you know the area, I guess that is, where Columbia Hospital is. And it's like under the George Washington kind of. The water was up so high there that I was driving my car, which is like a mini SUV, through like a, a, a flood that had the water almost at the windows on the side of the car. It was stuff, dirty ass New York City rats going through the water swimming, it was really, really crazy outside. And so for people, and then you turn around and you have that storm two days ago, and then this heat wave happening now, you can't, in some way they said across the country, there was an ice storm that happened in the last few days. You can't tell me that something is not happening with the ozone, like there is a problem. It's definitely, it's definitely, the weather is different. Like, you know, been around a long time and I haven't seen the shifts in weather, you know, this way. One day is at nighttime, it was damn near like 60 degrees. You know what I'm saying? It, it was, was like cool. It was mad cool. It was like 90 degrees and it was getting 60 degrees at night. It was just weird. Yeah. It was, it was, that's, it was like fall kind of like fall was approaching. It's just the beginning of the summer. So it's definitely been a lot of changes with the weather. Anybody who doesn't notice that, you know, is crazy. And, and that rain that day though, I was, I didn't leave my house. I looked out the window and was like, nah, I ain't going out there. And you know, in this, in, in, in the Bronx, there was a, there was a, it was so much water. The sinkhole. Right, that it made a sinkhole, a big sinkhole. That and the sinkhole crazy. was there. And then all of a sudden a van fell into the hole. Isn't it crazy? I don't, they should, we should really make sure that the clip of this situation gets into the show. 
for those who are watching it visually, because there's a car that is right in front of the van and in the bottom of the car falls down, but the car somehow is like hanging on. I'm like, and I, I looked at it and I said, ain't that life? Like you, everything falling out from behind or underneath you, but you still you really understand. <laughs> that was me. That one car was me, man. <laughs> somehow, half the wheel is in the hole, but we ain't in the hole. We in the hole, we in the hole, but we ain't in the hole. We ain't in the hole, we made it. Yo, crazy. So let's get into our news stories. Um, I found this thing online that was just crazy. This protest was happening in China. And, you know, there's so much going on. There's so much trauma. You know, before I even tell this story about China today, I opened up my social media in the bed, as we all probably do, checking to Instagram before getting out the bed early this morning. And the first thing that popped up on my timeline not the second or the third i didn't scroll it was the first image i saw was a man bloodied like like he the police had beaten him to the point where he was bloody all over everything just his sockets were all busted out and i said yo i can't i can't like i cannot i, I cannot start my day every day with this so it's like this was when you get into it's like you can't even you can't even open instagram you can't even open social media because it's traumatizing so the day I'm, i saw all these people protesting and i was like and then and of course i saw that they were um asian so i'm like let me see let me watch this and see what's going on what are they protesting and then i read the story and basically the banks froze or one bank froze these people's money. I don't know why, I still haven't figured out what happened, but they froze the people's assets and the people can't get their money, their life savings. So they went to go protest. A lot of Chinese people were standing there, probably, you know, thousands of them, or maybe it was hundreds, but it looked like thousands. And the police whooped on their behinds like they're wrong for protesting about their money. Listen, the institution of police around this world is crazy, man. These people then took these people money, their money been held up in his bank for a long, long time. They life save, like imagine your life savings in the bank and they just ain't giving it to you. And you, and you peacefully protest and the police come whoop your ass for what peacefully protesting to get your money. It's crazy. It just don't make no sense, man. This- But in China, that's how they roll. Listen, ain't look too much different than what we see out here. The poll, like well, they said- Unless you are- unless you are an insurrectionist at the Capitol. Oh yeah, they, then they open the door for you. They tell you, they give you directions and everything. Sure, tour. sure do. Like Michael said, the police been whooping heads on over here and they whoop some heads down there, man. Police <laughs> whooping heads all over the place. Mm -mm -mm. We just um, are a week away from the birthday, the 26th birthday of Jalen Walker. It's so sad, it's like, Poor Jalen. Like, does the world even remember Jalen Walker anymore? We, you know, people have moved on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it takes so much work nowadays to make sure you keep, um, you know, these folks, these unfortunate, which have become sort of hashtags in the storyline and keep them on TV and keep them as part of the dialogue. And folks get mad. Oh, oh, what y'all doing? Y'all using the cameras. Imagine if we didn't find ways to bring Yandy with the Love and Hip Hop cameras and then Portia with the Real Housewives cameras and all the other stuff that we did to keep Breonna Taylor. They would, it would, it's no way that Breonna Taylor would have stayed in the news, especially since we know with Black women that Black men, their stories start to sort of push ours out. Like when Black women are killed by the state, state sanctioned violence it's like it doesn't that those stories don't last at all if they make it at all black men of course it's still a struggle but it's definitely more attention paid to black men so what would you what would we have done if we were not able to create our own media and bring people around Breonna Taylor and now that's how I feel about Jalen Walker it's like now his 26th birthday has passed and you know it's way too soon for him to just be a storyline that happened, you know, he needs to be consistently in the press. I know that on his birthday, um, the attorneys call for the Department of Justice to get involved, you know, and th they should because 
the police will, their excuse is going to be that there was a gun that he had and they saw a shot fired and you keep asking, where's the ballistic report and all of the stuff? Maybe it's there, you know, it's, it's so much. And my aunt lives in Akron um, and some other family members and listening to them talk about the story, they're, they are getting information locally and from local news is very different from what we're hearing nationally. You know what I'm saying? It's very, very different. So the story is even worse when you listen to the local side. Well, I know that a man was shot over 40 something times. That's what they're saying. I still think 60, I know there was 90 round shot at the man. And for us not to continue to talk about that, for that not to be in a news cycle, is crazy to me. And that's why people talk about, like you said, they say, oh, y'all doing this for news. If we don't do it, you know, if we, if we don't really take that responsibility and we don't get in front of these cameras and, and, and say these names and make sure that these families and situations are highlighted, then it, it's swept under the rug. There's so many people that you don't hear about, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people say, oh, y'all go for the, you know, we, 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 what we try to do is bring attention. We try to bring awareness. We understand, you know, the injustices that are happening and families don't have the proper recourse, recourse or the proper platforms you know, they don't have the me, they don't have something, someone to elevate their voices. So when we come in, that's always what we try to do, man. And it's, it's sad, like you said, to see that on tw his 26th birthday, you know, is he's basically not even in the news cycle anymore. Nobody's talking about it. Not enough. Like it's, like it's common, like it's, it's just okay. It's not enough, you know, it's not enough outrage. Like you, we say, we're not, we're not outraged enough. You we're know? not, that's uh, our brother Angelo's attorney Angelo Pinto, I always have to correct myself. Um, you know, that's the statement that he made and we're not, we're not outraged enough. So it's our job to keep saying Jalen Walker's name and we will do that. And we are, we think the Department of Justice absolutely needs to pick up this case and investigate it directly um, to really see what went on. The attorney, Robert DiCello, uh, he, he says after the funeral, we did a press conference he said something that was very interesting that I never even thought about. He said the officers got a chance to go home, right? And watch, they were, no statements were taken there on the scene from all of these officers, at least 13 of them. They got a chance to go home and watch the news, which is where the press conference was done from the police department telling the world their side of the story. So now they listen to that they understand how to collaborate around it and they're all gonna say the same thing that the department has put out there as an official statement. I mean, it's so evident, it's so clear, the cover up. So, you know, definitely the Department of Justice needs to get involved in that. And I, my heart goes out to, um, you know, Kristen Clark, who is the, the head of the Civil Rights Division for the Department of Justice, because even though she's a friend and I love Kristen Clark, but I still have to also apply pressure on her, which we've done. We're doing it on Breonna Taylor. We went and did a protest there and, and you know, went to her office and demanded to, uh, to serve them with our petitions that people all over the country signed saying that the DOJ needs to get involved. And there's been a number of other cases where we've done the same. We unfortunately cannot give that sister, uh, you know, an easy time while she's in office, but it's a lot of a burden to carry as a black woman to be the head of a department that has so many issues coming in the door every day and trying to make the right decisions about which cases you're going to go after, which cases you're going to investigate. It's hard work, but it's work that she wanted to do. And there now we all have to hold her responsible. Exactly, man. That's why she got in the office. You know, we we seen something in her that identified with our struggle that she had been on these front lines. She had understood a lot of what we were dealing with. And that's why people put her in office now. So, you know, I know it's going to be tough, you know, because and, and this is why people like, hey, you need to run for office. I don't want to run for office because I don't want to be bound by any politics. I don't want to be bound by any system that, you know, pretty much I have to 
deal with what I know is right. And then I know what the system is saying to do. So she's in there trying to balance this and be as fair as possible, but then go within the system that she's in. So it's, it's a lot. In the system, working yep. for Merrick Garland, who's another person, you know, he's the, the uh, attorney general. And I believe that Merrick Garland wants to do some of the right things. I mean, first of all, we have to be real clear and make sure that we say that they have been filing cases. Yes, They've sir. been filing cases. Uh, in the parchment prison situation uh, where we called for along with Rock Nation and a bunch of other people, uh, Yo Gotti, uh, when we called for parchment to be investigated, the Department of Justice came out saying that the civil rights of uh, incarcerated individuals in that prison were being violated. So there's been cases, there's been situations where we see the Department of Justice stepping in it's not enough, though. It's not enough, right? And and I don't know when it ever will be enough. Um, but again, to your point, hey, and and she actually was appointed by Merrick Garland to be the head of the Civil Rights Division, and she had to go through a whole lot of um, questioning in order to get confirmed by uh, the Senate. Uh, and one of the things they asked her about was her relationship with me. It was it was on the record that they challenged her about signing a letter on my behalf uh, to support me during the time when I was under attack, um, you know, with the Women's March. So they really, you know, they gonna kick everybody, all sides are kicking the doors. And, you know, it's important that the Department of Justice stay focused and they need to do their jobs. So that's that on that. Mm -hmm. Next is the street renaming for Eric Garner. Uh, in Staten Island, they named renamed the street for him. I saw Miss Carr, Gwen Carr, um, you know, looking like she was just so proud, you know, that something happened to always put a, a stake a claim, if you will, put a stake in the ground right there in that space for her son. Uh, and I saw somebody online like, why do we choose these symbolic gestures or why do we settle for symbolic gestures? It's not a settling. That lady fought for justice and her son, I mean, her grandson, Eric Garner Jr., he also um, is a part of this. He fought, they fought, right? Their daughter, their, their, his sister, what's her name? Uh, Erica Garner, she died fighting for her father. They did all that they could do. So the street renaming, while yes, it's only symbolic, it's not gonna bring back Eric and it certainly doesn't give him justice. They deserve that also. They deserve the streets to be renamed. They deserve the money they won from the lawsuit. They deserve guilty. Uh, they deserve convictions. They deserve all of that. And we, unfortunately, we can't control getting each one of those things as we would like for it to be. But when we do get certain things, it's important that people, when they, especially on Staten Island, where all those cops live, because you know Staten Island is heavy police. Heavy. And the fact that they have to drive down a street named after a black man that they killed and disregarded, right? Mm -hmm. And smeared his name, e even though that may not be real true justice, but it at least is something, it's a gesture that those individuals would not be comfortable just living when they go to Google, when they tell their family where to, how to find their homes, they're gonna have to say, Eric Garner away. Yeah. As a part of, you know, and I, I'm not saying again that I think it's the best thing in the world, but those folks, they didn't just settle, they fought and they continued to fight. And Ms. Garner is everywhere around this country fighting for other families as well. And that's the truth, man. You, like you said, you know, it's not, it, I'm sure that we would definitely rather have Eric Garner, right? Instead of the name on the street, we would rather have justice for fire Daniel Pantaleo. We would rather have him inside of prison. You know, we, we fought for all those things. But as we get something, some level of acknowledgement, you know, to make sure that he didn't die in vain, that he's immortalized, that the, the story of Eric Garner will be told, that that block will symbolize what it is that they, they lost and what it is that he represented to this world and how he ignited fires through this city and got people to really fight for justice you know we, we we don't want to take that away you don't want to see when you see a, a mother smiling that her her child's name is somewhere knowing that she hadn't smiled for years 
knowing that we we normally see him Miss Carr on the front of a newspaper because she's right. sad about a situation. You know, she's receiving bad news that they're not going to fire the officer, that they're not going to prosecute. Right. So when you when you're able to see some level of comfort, let that lady enjoy that. You know, it's not about you. It ain't about what, what you think. Right. You maybe you don't want that. But this family gets to enjoy the little things that they do because they've been through so much trauma. So, you know, congratulations on that. You know, our heart goes out to that family and we still want justice and we still want the officer locked up. And hopefully we'll get, you know, a district attorney in New York City that we can look and reopen this case and actually get some justice for Eric Garner because that's still, still to go. That's right. That's right. That's right. I don't know. Is that possible? Like we should really, really look into that because there are new district attorneys. Like what could they do? I don't know. Maybe they can't. But that's a good question. We should find that out from our legal experts like what can be done that there's, no, there is no, there's no statute of limitation on, on because the, the the department of justice said they weren't gonna do anything they never filed any charges so it's not like double jeopardy if you look if they look and say that they they reviewed it and they decided that they want to file charges you know hey I doubt that anybody is going to be like that. We're old. saying we told them to open up all the cases that certain lawyers have done. Uh, the, 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 that was for the Central Park Five. We said that the new attorney general, I mean, excuse me, the new district attorney, Alvin Bragg in New York City, needs to open up the files of the previous administrations to see whether or not what happened to the Central Park Five has happened to other people um you know in in new york and we know that it has because there's one guy in jail who basically reported that the same coercing and uh threatening that happened to the central park five happened to him and that's why he uh you know was was serving time in prison so that's that anyway um the sesame streets uh case and we should talk about this today because there's a lot happening and over the last few days I think the bombshell has dropped and you know, folks who don't know about what took place at Sesame Place, pretty much um, a family, a black woman was there with her niece and her daughter, both of them six year old, cute little girls, beautiful little princesses. And they were on the line at the parade waiting for the characters to come down and I forget what this one's name is, Marita, Burita, something. Um, it's coming down the street. And the and and this character high fives a white woman. You see Rosita. Her, who? Rosita, Rosita. You see her, it's her. Well, I guess it's her because she is the character, but we don't know who's behind the character. But nonetheless, Rosita is interacting with different people and all of them appear to be white folks like right in that very short period of time once she gets to these two little black girls she says no to them and like shuns them off and avoids them altogether and walks past them what we now know is that she went di right directly after the family to a white person and hugged them right so it's very clear yeah. the discrimination that took place however and it's unfortunate that we're in a time where we need video footage that pretty much shows every single thing because the mother said jody said that the character went rosita went to a white family people say oh i don't know if that's true i can't say for sure if that you know you don't have video okay so now there's footage of it but even before that just the experience i didn't need to see what takes place after all mm -hmm. i needed was just right there that uh, uh, that interaction it was just dead wrong and so until freedom we got involved and we issued a warning telling other families Black families particularly, but also our allies, to be careful when considering where you want to take your children this summer, your vacation time, and make sure you know that at Sesame Place, they are discriminating against Black kids. And of course, all these other videos have come out where you see the same thing happening with the same character and some other characters and other situations. It's really, really unfortunate. Um, and we're standing with Jody and the family. We had our press conference together last week. 
Um, like I said, this new information is out there. Uh, and, you know, I just, and, 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 and you know, and, it will, and we're talking about racism today on the show, but I'll say this last thing. I saw a couple people in the comment section like, well, I went there with my family and it didn't happen to me. You know, I don't know. And it's like, what is, why do black people always feel the need just to, not all black people, but some black people feel the need to try to explain away Massa's problems? Like why? Let Massa is not even willing to apologize and deal with their own problems, right? And I say Massa being very, 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 very sarcastic because you ain't nobody's Massa of ours. But the point is the mindset is, is like, we just want to defend them so quick. And it's just crazy. It's just crazy because, you know, there are so many people, right, who are either blind or ignorant to the fact of what racism is, right? You have some people who will tell us that that's not that serious and that we're overreacting, right? And when you when, when you deal with those situations, when, when you when we talk to Jody and her response as she watched her niece and her daughter being discriminated against, being in that situation, you know, you don't get to tell somebody what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, we we have so many different black people, like you heard the, the comment, Little Wayne talking about he's never experienced racism in America. You know, you hear Kanye talking about slavery was a choice that we, and we get people who have different realities, right? Some of them have more money. They, you know, they, they, they're idolized in certain regards. So they don't deal or, or just choose not to acknowledge what mm -hmm. common black people are dealing with, just regular black folks every day. And there are, you, you have people like LeBron James where they write a nigger on his gate. You know what I'm saying? Racism is a serious thing and it's not something that just, oh, get over it. You know, y'all just overreacting. It's not that serious. No, it is that serious. You know, because other people don't experience that. Other people aren't discriminated against by just because the color of their skin or because of where they live or because of how they look, you know? And just watching that video, man, it really pained me. And then seeing the little girl, you know, at the press conference and, and meeting Jody and just seeing how they or just seem like good people. Mm -hmm. You know, people are trying to say that we use racism as a, a shield or, you know, we, um, what, what they what is it that they say I do? I'm race baiting. Race baiting. You know, race baiting. You're a race baiter, and it's like, how can I bait something that ain't there? How, I'm race baiting. I don't. Right. I'm not the person dealing with these situations. Right. I'm not. I, when I deal with my, own, it. you're not the. I'm not causing it. Right. Yeah, I'm not the perpetrator of it. So how am I? I'm exposing it. I'm showing right. you what we deal with on a regular basis every day, and people want it rather willing. Willful ignorance is a thing. Yeah, you know, it, is, it is. And the family is saying they don't even they're not even trying to file a lawsuit. Right. They're not filing a lawsuit for a million dollars, two million dollars. They're saying, yes, they should be compensated by the park. The park should be willing to just give them something that covers the mental health support and some of the pain and suffering of the children. And, you know, and what the, and their mom and, and your aunt and mom and what she experienced, but they're not even looking to file a lawsuit. They want people fired and they want changes within the policies within the, the company. And, and from what I can see, hopefully we'll get to talk to our guests today about this. They need a new PR specialist. They need training from the top of Sesame Place all the way to whoever works, in, you know, wherever, every single part of the business needs to go through some type of training and assessment because yo like the statement y'all put out has 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 caused additional harm so it was like it was already the insult and now there's injury beyond that or there was already the injury and now there's insult on top of it it's just crazy um we should talk about the history of sesame place because what we know is this is a show that started in harlem Right, or it was about Harlem. It's so many things that we know about the history of this of this um business that we need to talk about. But our guest is joining yeah. us. So you know, we have this saying um, on street politicians that our guests, so many of them are our friends because True. every single 
week, we talk to people who are doing incredible things all around the nation, people who are so important to our movement and our culture. Um, and, and it just so happens that they are our friends. They are people we love yeah. and know. And in this situation, it's not, you're not just a friend. We're being joined by our sister. Somebody that we love and admire. My best friend. Yes, yes, yes. Somebody we love and admire so much. You all may have heard of her. You certainly, if you follow either one of us on socials, especially <laughs> me, you get a chance to see the beauty and the brilliance of Miss Diddy uh, every single day. And Miss Diddy is not because of the other Diddy. She just Diddy on her own I'm just uh, yes, you just diddy um and she is a master marketer uh someone that the influencers and the artists of our time and corporations and the like turn to for expert advice uh expert organization and also activations and her company, the brand group, uh, is really a cutting edge marketing firm that is doing amazing work, not just in LA, which is her home base. And she surely will tell you that she is from LA, uh, but it also does great work internationally and nationally. And so welcome to Street Politicians for the first time, our dear- Don't be the last. Don't be the last. Don't be a little late. 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 You should have been here about two months ago, but you know, <laughs> Mind not the heart. Yes, I okay. will. <laughs> I will. Thanks for being. I'm honest. so honored to be here with y'all. I mean, I'm gonna take that recording, and that's gonna be my introduction <laughs> across the way in the world. Okay, <laughs> but yes, she do. Now that lady, now that lady is good. <laughs> the lady is good. The lady's good. I'm honored to be here uh, with both of you guys. Definitely. Family is a word that can't be thrown around as it relates to us on this on this Zoom right now. Um, we all take it very seriously with each other. And beside me being extremely honored to be here with you guys, I respect you guys so much. I admire you. Um, and I'm inspired by you guys personally, business-wise, day-to-day, month-to-month. And so um, I love you guys so much. And that's a that's a real word, word coming from me to you guys. And I know it's the same on the other side. First of all, we want to say that we love you and we appreciate you. You know, you honored us a few weeks back at, you know, and it was amazing. The The whole event was dope. You all, you know how to shut it down. That was probably the favorite event of the BT weekend. Toast you know, to, no to Black Hollywood. Toast to Black Hollywood yes. was the top event that I've been through. No shade to nobody else. Everything was no good. Shade. But Diddy had the best event. And Thank that's you, just buddy. hands down to from me to you. Um, you. So we want to celebrate you. We know all the work you do. I just want to know for the people, where did you get this name, Miss Diddy? Where did you know what? It's, I, they've called me Diddy and Diddy Bob since high school. Did so you? it's like a very aged name for me. I won't give a full long details on those years back then. But um, yeah, it's it's been that way for so many years. And it, it was, um, it just kind of worked out to, you know, of course people like, she's like the female pup or something like that. So it just kind of worked out. And thank God, because I mean, thank God I do really good work because he would have completely shut it down, of course. <laughs> but like, right, like, you know, ain't, like no. ain't no other ditties. <laughs> ain't no other in this world. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm grateful that I've actually, you know, withheld the 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 name and you know the integrity behind it. So that's pretty dope because it could have went it could have went left early on. Yeah, Puff, you know, did he don't if it don't work, he didn't like who that? No, nah, no, nah, she can't use that name. Nah, he he can get shut it down. He knows yeah. how he knows how to help market you and help not market you. So <laughs> either way. <laughs> And actually, hours work, and, four and, a half. and actually, you work with Ciroc, Um and yeah, have, yeah, for sure. I've definitely, yeah, Ciroc De Leon. Um, I've actually worked with Ciroc on multiple on multiple facets since for probably like ten years or so. Because there was other people that worked in the company, and um, Nathan worked with Puff for a long, long time. And I would do. Uh, I've always worked with. Um, um, brands, liquor brands and spirits because of doing so many events and, and being a promoter and things like that. So I just always had really great relationships 
across the board. So I've worked with all of them, um, but I've definitely worked with Surat for a very long time in, in well, different I just facets. Say, I just want to say one thing that, yes, you had the number one event uh, during BET weekend. However, yes. I have to give you a close second. You were like 1A and then there was a 1B and that was that damn club quarantine because it was popping. Oh yeah, I know it was popping. Y'all was there. The folks was there at 6 a.m. It was amazing. I, it was amazing. I was so tired. Now you can't be tired, tired at club quarantine. Ain't no. Oh. No, no, you got to stay up, Mike. And that's the thing. I couldn't. I said, y'all listen. Okay, I got to stay in this here bed. I tried to make it out in my mind. It didn't work out. And you have a wonderful relationship with D-Nice as well. Um, yes. Yeah, so, you know, you 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 know every damn body. Who doesn't do everybody. it? Well? Everybody. Everybody. But you know what? Being a promoter early on in my career allowed me to have really dope relationships with a lot of people in different times in their careers. Do you know what I mean? Like early on in their careers or later or whatever, you know, Jazz Prince has always been a really great friend of mine. So when he had Drake early, early on, he's like, you got to meet my artist. It's like, everyone is like that. You know? So if I'm cool and we're cool and we have a good relationship, we just keep the relationship. So like, I know people be like, you just know everybody, but it comes from all different sides of the world. You know what I mean? So, so you started out being a, a promoter. Yeah, I was a promoter. In the beginning of my, well, I was, I actually worked with Ye first when he went, well, well, good music, when Kanye started good music. So I did like the West Coast promotions over there. And then that kind of segued me into promoting. Um, and it just, I just, because I always had a marketing mind or like, I could see things, you know, kind of on a grand scale. Um, and I've always been a visionary. It made me in promoting really important um and really uh kind of irreplaceable in nightlife because of the way i took look at it you know i wasn't a guy promoting i wasn't trying to get with the girls or drink or anything like that there's a lot of great guy promoters but my brain and it was like i want to make a movie every single time i do a party i want it to be like this it needs to be this big it needs to feel like this like i knew media like i was really the first promoter to really bring in um blog awareness and blogs to nightlife that didn't really exist back then and also like a camera you didn't really bring cameras into the clubs back then that's not that wasn't like a thing you know like you didn't really do that you know it was like you felt underground in a club right so like I put cameras in the clubs I wanted it I wanted to shoot promo videos that look like rap videos like that wasn't done before I started promoting back in the day and so it's took on a life of its own and everyone kind of markets in that way now. Um, so I'm glad to see the, the evolution of it. My yeah. life is important. So go ahead, Mice. No, 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 I was about to ask you. So as a woman promoter and a woman ambassador mm -hmm. and brand, do you feel like it's harder? Do you see like sexism within the industry? Or yeah, sure. I mean, a hundred percent, you know, and, and the thing about my career and my personality, like you guys know me extremely well. So, you know, my assertiveness really led in a lot of areas, you know, I'm, I'm really sweet and I'm really graceful, but my assertiveness led in areas and it really, sh it helps kind of shut down things, you know, because the thing about it, I say this and, and people don't like this, but it's true. A man can never like and understand the word respect to what I'm saying, like view a woman or respect a woman the way he'll respect another man. It's just, it's, I don't think biologically a man can do it. And it's not that they feel disrespectful to a woman. It's just that to a man to, if they're a man to woman, there's no threat of violence. There's threat of violence man to man. You see what I'm saying? So there ha there's a level of respect that's gonna be withheld a man to man. And biologically, we're hell in a different light we're a woman you know so mm -hmm. for me my personality led and my respect and I, I was grateful and able to work and build and become successful in the city that I'm from you know and a, a, sometimes that doesn't happen that way with people people either move to Hollywood move to New York move to wherever and try to become what they're trying to become but I became successful in the city that I'm from. So my ties and all my different areas of my ties also protected me. You know what I'm saying? I was like, nah, don't mess with my city. We already know what, you know what I'm saying? What she tied, 
you know, I don't be playing with that, you know? And so it worked out, but it's a lot of sexism. And, you know, women, they ask me, you know, what would you, cause they want to take on the, what I've done in my career. And it's like, I don't encourage it all the time. I'm like, you gotta be realistic about this thing. You know what I'm saying? Like I could check, I could check a man, you know, in a way. And that is clear, but a lot of women can't do that. So I don't feel comfortable, but do you feel like it's harden you like sometimes I feel that sure I remember sure. being with you at a pool party that was your event uh in mm-hmm. Miami and I think all of us mm-hmm. were there. everybody was mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. of us were together um and I remember a man like trying not to let you get into your own space or do mm-hmm. something and you got into mm-hmm. it with the man and I remember thinking that I go through this all all the time like literally I get disrespected by men whether they be security the 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 uber driver the all around the time all around the place all the time and I find myself having to step out of character so much so um and I'm trying to learn how to get better but I find myself like always in a battle do you feel like that yeah, it's tough because I feel like, aside from what I said about men respect and, and what they feel about a man versus a woman, aside from that, I think the value of women is so depreciated, it's so at an all-time low, that it's hard for men to, to look at women for the, the gracious gift that we are. Not all men, because there's some, at, like my, it's like, there's, I have great homeboys, I have great relationships with men great chemistry with men that protect me and I feel safe around and they don't they would they don't handle women that way but I think as an overall thing in the world I think women are at a at a very low devalued place right now and I think that affects the way men deal with women around the world because I also in my environment if a man knows who I am I don't got no issues but if he doesn't know how I am, we might be have a little cute dress on or something like that. And then now I got to check you on you understanding that I'm not one of this out here that's going on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I remember yesterday, yesterday I went to um, stop through Mookie Betts uh, and Nelly's uh, all-star after party or whatever, just for a second. And so man, I'm sitting down in the section, man comes up and he's like, you, uh, you hear the party? No. I, I I do business. I'm not, don't, don't, you know, go that way. What don't confuse me. Don't confuse me. But it's hard because men are, the value of women is low, especially black women. It's low, low, mm. low. Well, I want to say, I apologize on behalf <laughs> of men because, you know, I, I, I know, I, I see it all the time, like being with y'all, yeah. being around women, you know, I find, I constantly find myself having to check and get into situations mm-hmm. or, you know, intervene. So, uh, you know, but it's, it's a process because it, it took me yeah. to not even notice those things were happening, right? Because, yeah. you know, um, what do we call it? What, what is the word that you always use to describe it? Patriarchy. Patriarchy. Patriarchy yeah. is something that we've just been taught, right? We've been taught sure. to... When, like you said, there's no threat of violence when you look at a woman. There's no threat of anything. And then you look at a woman, especially if she's a pretty woman, then your first instinct is to kind of flirt this or do something, right? So it, it has to, we have to get to a level of really just acknowledging and just understanding. And we got to teach these young boys that because yeah. they know that because they we was we was taught wrong. A lot of us was taught right. to deal with women from a lesser place. So, you know, yeah. that's a woman, a man, and a woman is this, and, and there's a separation. So, you know, we got to re- we got to reteach that and relearn. So, I just want and to- and I tell that. young men, black men, all the time, mice on the same level as you're saying. I tell young black men all the time, if it comes that point, like, yo, do you, you have a black grandmother? You have a black mother? Okay, so like, why are you even playing? Like, don't even play that. You know, and then and then they'll check. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, was you raised by your grandmother? Did she? Okay, right. so trying why to are you talking call to their me like that? Calling their attention yeah. back to your own. So group. what they understand? Yeah, mm-hmm. like you would lose your mind if somebody disrespects your grandmother. Like you don't play those type of games. So like, wheel it back in, young man, mm-hmm. young soldier. <laughs> right, because you're you're in, you're in nightlife a lot, and so you know I would imagine that you encounter 
people who are not just, well, first of all, young people, and also some of them who have some money. So they really think that they have the power to do and say whatever they want. And then at the time that you're dealing with them, they're drinking alcohol, so they're intoxicated, or they could be doing it's other that. things. And so it's a lot to, to manage. And since, you know, talking about working with brands, because, you know, obviously, you know, you working with um, many spirits, you've been able yeah. to sort of connect the dots of events with, sure. uh, with the culture. You had us at a toast to Black Hollywood, which are activists, Trade the Truth also, yeah. who um, does great work in Houston and around the country. Um, yeah. you know, I, I call, I call Trey like a, a human rights leader. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, that's good. Lane, yeah. Um, and we're in the social justice lane. And so you brought all of those things together. Talk about that and how you see not just the entertainment world, but also your social justice friends and your activists and yeah. others coming together with brands. You know what? That that was always important to me, important to me because it's who I am. It's a piece of it's all pieces of who I am, every person, right? So even when I was promoting, like people would just focus on maybe a one person to promote. So I'd be like, no, like my A and R friends were just as important to come as the celebrity who you think you're inviting or whatever the case may be because all of these pieces of people are exactly who I am like I'm a church girl I'm gonna go to girl I'm gonna go to church on Sunday honey but I'm gonna have me a sidecar you know what I'm saying no later road and I'm gonna have me a good time and I'm gonna go to Miami and I'm you know what I mean and so I don't think that you have to be not be exactly who you are. And so my friends happen to live in all of those spaces. Like I'm close to my pastor. I'm close to my social justice friend. I'm close to my my singers and rappers and artists and actors. And the, the, and the mayor. The mayor. The mayor. Of, like, you know, politicians. and all of those worlds coming together. Only that is what we actually are. That's who we really are you know what i'm saying Eat maverick city the biggest gospel group in the world and my fr kurt franklin is my great friend you know and so is you know not to comp compare but so is meek mill so is you know what i mean and so those those the world in rooms that i created in the 15 plus years of my career are all pieces of exactly who i am and that was always important to me that people see each of you guys in the rooms together because you're all one like so many people were so excited to see my son like I never even got to tell you that so many even rappers like I seen a picture with you and Simba and like you and Benny yeah. the Butch it's like those and, and then just see everybody was so excited and it's like those are the rooms that are important because it's the people that you may not be able to see on a normal and you're having real conversations mm -hmm. and that's what I've learned like even dealing in corporations brands spirits all of that the real conversations is what moves the needle. And that's why people are like, well, how do you get these brand deals or how do you get these partnerships? Because I have real conversations with people. Mm. You know what I mean? I just did an event with UBS, the bank, and Mookie Betts. It's like, I have real conversations with UBS, you know, about everything that's going on. You know, United Nations was a client of mine at the time that, you know, um, of, of Breonna Taylor's whole, whole thing going on. Like, and I'm having real conversations with these people from all race. I'm not playing none of those games. I'm exactly who I am. And so the, the rooms that I create are always about all the pieces of me, you know? Mm. And not and no one being able to be like, you can't do that because you should stay in this way or you're that. I don't, I just don't believe in that. Like black people are magical, you know, and we we have so many facets of us you know what I mean so the 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 rapper that can also sing but can also act like what if Ice Cube didn't make Friday what mm -hmm. if Ice Cube didn't create the lane where you put comedians and cool and actors and rappers in one movie and you make classics like what if that didn't happen like mm -hmm. it would change the trajectory of our culture as a whole you know what I'm saying so that was always important to me to mesh, mesh those worlds it's, it's important to me too, because being starting out as a hip hop artist and then, you know, maturing and evolving into an activist. Absolutely. And understanding the importance of both of them, right? Because hip hop yes. is so, it's the culture, right? So if, if we're yes. not involved in activism, we're not connected to the real 
the real meats and potato of what's going on with our people, then what are we doing? So I, I've had those conversations with people. Like you said, I've been in the club and had DJ come up to me like, what you doing in here in the strip club? And then what you doing? The same thing you doing here. I'm giving me a drink. Oh, God, you said, what do you mean? Are you to, nah, bro, I don't know what you think, but you know, I'm yeah. of the culture. But I just don't want, I want to make sure that my people are, are treated properly. I want to make sure we get the rights and nobody's killing us, but I'm still going and have me some Hennessy with some Red Bull. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to have a good time because this is who I am. Time. That's it. People wow. are so miserable because they're not able to be who they are. You just have to be who you are. Like, I've always been had good relations with all my pa well, my pastors. Like, and they follow me. And they, and they know. know. And they know. And they know because my pastor, who my son knows, it, my whole world opens up when he calls me, right? Like yeah. he, he is the most, he's, he is my Same. everything, my past Same. because, and you know, some people might not understand that. And I wish that folks would have an experience with their pastor the way that I have, because when I was in the darkest moments of my life, and I ain't even talking about recent dark stuff. I'm talking about dark stuff that went on that folks don't know sure. anything about. Cause you know, sure. there's dark stuff that you tell the world. And then Come there's dark stuff that you don't tell anybody about. Absolutely. And he sat in the middle of that, that with me, yeah. right? And was there with no judgment through with no judgment, taught me so much, you know, yeah. inspired me in so many ways. But he also will call me and be like, I see you on the internet with your booty hanging out. Like, you know, Put it back here. damn, you know, <laughs> you Put sure that gotta have the whole, like, can you put anything and you know my response is you know who i am and he moves right on because the, he yeah. knows me he knows who i am yeah. i'm being authentically me and it burns people yeah. burns them yeah. and, and and as I'm, I'm always saying most of those who i've heard from about don't put your bikini pictures on the internet why you got to do this on your personal page by the way until freedom's page there's no bikinis on there until Freedom's page is all about the work. My page, where I, this is my, my page, has all of me on it, right? Yeah. So it's gospel, it's twerking, it's bikini, it's vacationing, it is every single element, and it's, of course, the work that I truly believe in. And most of the people who I've heard from that have an issue are men. Most of them are oh, men. Oh, interesting. I hardly have heard from any women to tell me to put my clothes on or don't let them change you or you know and and i of course i'm in the comment section it may be women men or whatever equal but i'm talking about people i know who have reached yeah. out to me behind the scenes to say hey i'm feeling a way about this it's generally been men but anyway because i know you got short time let's talk about doritos that is a new okay. Uh, you know, venture for you. I was so happy. And yo, we've done so much work just to just to give people an understanding of how social justice, the civil rights movement, the individuals like yourself, which running marketing firms, uh, PR folks that are like really about it, how we're changing culture, advertising agencies like Global Hue, which which is no longer. But at one point, Don Coleman and Global Hue, they were a part of those who helped to shift the tide. They didn't have young Black women mm -hmm. out of Compton on mm -hmm. no goddamn Doritos commercial. It just didn't happen. Oh. Let's go, Diddy Ness. Name Diddy. That's Name right. Diddy. Right. Tell me when that was happening. Help me. Help me. Dang, that's crazy. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. That's true. I mean, they didn't, and you know, and that again, it goes to, it sounds corny, but it goes to like being exactly who you are. You know what I'm saying? Like I wouldn't be able to have got to this place in my career and where I am with these level of partnerships without being who I am. And the true essence of me is a young girl from the hood, from Compton that you know, built my life up brick by brick, didn't have any guidance. My parents didn't set me up. They did what I guess they felt they could, but they didn't set me up and no shock to them, but it's just life, you know, and I've had to build that up and 
to go through all the emotions and all the things that it takes to go through business and life. And as you learn and as you're learning, because you're learning as you go, there's no, I haven't, even in the Doritos commercial, I said, there's no real blueprint for life because no one sat a book in front of me and said, Hey, here's what you do. And even to your point earlier, it's like, no one also said, here's what happens when you get money. Here's what you do when you, it's who does that, who do you become at that point? That's what happens with a lot of young black and brown people that end up getting money. Cause no one said, Hey, here's what it's going to feel like when you get money, these things are going to change. These things are going to happen and you're going to have to weather through them to the best of your ability and navigate, you know? And so they didn't have the Miss Diddy's and the Tamika Mallory's and the My Sons of the world. And I'm so grateful that the world has opened up to whereas those opportunities are so prevalent because we've been a part of their cultures for so long. And my partnership with Doritos, I'm really excited about because it's a part of their, you know, $5 million pledge, which is one of their pledges to black and brown creatives and, and black and brown communities and everything like that. And they really have put their money where their mouth is. And that's people that I truly choose to be in business with. Not one thing that I said needs to happen, didn't happen. Everything has happened. You know what I mean? Like, even down to the commercial, there's a couple components of it. We shot the major commercial in New York um, with Ego, um, who's who's on SNL. She's an incredible Black sketch um, comedian, but she's a really great actress. And, um, you know, I, I they wanted to shoot in Los Angeles, of course. And I'm like, cool, you coming here? I'm taking you to the hood. We're going to South Central. And they like that. You know, there was no like, oh, well, we're not, you know, we just want to. No, they did. They came down. You know, they pledged twenty five thousand, which is a part of it, um, to my to my um, charity that I partner with, my foundation. I partner with Sola I Can, and they really put their money where their mouth is. And PepsiCo as well. I took the president of PepsiCo down to South Central, Derek Lewis, the black man. You know, the highest ranking black man in PepsiCo. He's been there over thirty years. You know, and he has been adamant about being involved in community moves and being present and he literally took a flight just to come to los angeles to go see, to go to south central and the heart of south central to go to solar i can beehive and to see what's going on in the community and he took a two-hour tour with us there and we talked about everything and you know these are the moves that i feel matter right we could partner with these with these companies we can make money with them or whatever the case may be but they'll forever, I'm forever in debt to them because of the way they've showed up, you know, and this is in a short amount of time. What a lot of people don't understand, the the young lady that um, I met from Dorito, she's actually on a Frito Lay site. Her name is Kimberly. She's incredible, Kimberly Scott. Tamika and I were actually on vacation in the Bahamas in December, and that's where I met her in the Bahamas. She came, you remember I was, she came up to me and she was like, I know what you do. I know your work. I'm a huge fan of your work. We should work together. And I'm like, man, like, what's going on, Black woman? Like, what's going on, Queen? She's like, I work at Freedom, like, da-da-da. So we just built there. Tamika flew in the next day. We, you know, she met Tamika. She's, of course, a huge fan of Tamika. And, you know, they've just been, she's been a driving force, a Black woman in that space. She's a mastermind. And she, um, I so, I tip my hat off to her, too, but PepsiCo, Doritos, and everything that has to do in that organization, I'm going to forever be in debt to because I've seen with my two eyes in a short amount of time the way they've shown up. And yeah. that's that's people I care to be in business before with. You, before yeah. you go, my son, to your point, because I just got to stick one little thing in Man, there. Well, two, two quick things, because I know you got to go. This is just such a good interview. Um, one, the issue of like so when you talk about pepsi right like i know them mm -hmm. for some great stuff but i also know them for some areas that they've had to do some serious work on right and we don't know sure, that sure. Be corrected talk about that like how do you deal with brands knowing that on one hand they may be some real funky stuff going on but then you yeah. see where they're doing good work at the same time what is especially from your perspective and the last thing i want you to talk about which ain't got shit to do with what we just said is your fashion so you can put that at the very very end so the people but we was going to talk about some serious we got we got to talk yeah, about we got to talk about fashion real quick before we go I out of here them on but instagram I mean, my son we going to talk about serious nah because 
because the people want the full they want fashion all the series. <laughs> fashion series but, but you know what Tamika I um I have conversations mm. because I am an entrepreneur and I am not, and because I serve God and no man I'm not afraid to have conversations mm. because I'm also queen of hey maybe we should have worked together I'm not I'm not driven by an amount by a status, a person. I'm not driven by any of that. I didn't tell the best of them we should work together. And they, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, yeah, exactly. Because you're not used to, once you become a starting person or in your role or who you are, you're not used to people dealing with you like that. Mm. So I have real conversations and I like to understand missteps, right? I didn't have the full, I'm actually going to now have the full conversation about that because I didn't think about that before uh with with about PepsiCo where I where missteps happen is us not being in the rooms Mm. Mm. it's classic examples of us not being in the rooms right so when we're talking about this whole inclusiveness and all of this it's it's interesting I watch I watch some of the interview from the CEO of Essence on um the breakfast club and she said i'm not talking about inclusion i'm talking about black Mm. i keep that inclusion over there basically we're not talking about that we're talking about black because inclusion means everyone Mm -hmm. but it also means that black is at the bottom of the totem pole in that inclusion Mm -hmm. you know inclusion means white women because for a long time now it was just the big boys handling it you see what i'm saying so I have real conversations. Where do you sit with things? Where is going on? I remember in, even in Doritos, um, there's a woman named McAllen that works in there and Rob, they're both white uh, people and they are incredible. And they had to sit in Zoom meetings where I'm sure, well, they didn't look uncomfortable, but it might've been because my approach, my assertiveness, my certainty on, hey, if there's this one person working on what I got going on, I need you to understand a couple of things. And they took it and they took it and they took it with love, with dignity. And they weren't, they didn't shy away from any of the conversations. They didn't act like these things don't exist and they wanted to learn. And that's the importance of conversation in all communities is them wanting to learn, not being defensive and listening to what we got to say, you know? And so I don't mind having those conversations because either way, I'm, I'm good. God got me. So I'm not pressed either way. I'm not cowering down. I'm not shying down. And I think that's what we have to say. I gave my experiences in racism. I gave my experiences as a young black woman doing marketing on a high scale, on a high level with the young white girls getting the accounts, not saying like that, but it's just the truth. And then calling me to do the work. Hey, Diddy, so we have, we want to see if you can. Oh, you want to see if I can, because you actually can you know? So it's really about those conversations and being honest because trust me, Google's a powerful tool. So they see all these interviews and how how assertive I am in my my level of communication. And that's not going to change for whoever I do, whoever I do business with. That's right. And you know what? That brings me to my question before you get into this fashion that, you know, but the question is we see the Sesame. We was talking about the Sesame street you know, the situation yes. with, you know, the discrimination against the young kids. And um yes. And then they put out a statement which didn't really make sense at all. You know, right. Being someone in marketing, being branding, you know, dealing yeah. with all these things you're talking about. What would you have done differently? What would you have done in that situation if you was working with Sesame Street? Yeah. How would you place. have Sesame made? Place? Sesame Place. Sesame Place. Here's the thing. The first of all, yet again, who are in these rooms, right? Who has already witnessed this? Who are making these decisions? Who is hiring? Who mm-hmm. are doing the trainings? Mm-hmm. Who? Who? Where are the? Are the trainings uh, even happening? Are the trainings? The, the even trainings happening? aren't happening. That's mm-hmm. a new thing, by the way. That's a new thing, so that people can smooth over. I know mm-hmm. PR stunts. I know marketing. So those are smooth things. Also. The, the 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 time of people writing having these PR stunts these these written things that's a time of the past show your face mm. show your heart mm. right because you can also be the president of something the VP or whatever and not be in agreement with something that your employee did 
Mm-hmm. And you, and, and, and so it's not about saving face. It's about showing your hand, showing your face and showing your heart. Mm-hmm. Hey guys, I'm, I'm, I too am appalled at what happened. And we're going to take a deeper look. You can also have language around things that don't implicate someone. If you don't know their true intentions, because it's all relative. You got to put your fingers up. All of it is relative. If you don't know someone's true, you don't know the the character's true intention. They didn't see the kid, whatever. Yes, you did, but fine. But show your face and show your heart. So the, 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 the typing up a PR letter, we don't want to see that anymore. Mm -hmm. If that was my client, I wouldn't allow them to do that. And if they chose to still do that, I would show my face and show my heart and say, I don't agree. Mm -hmm. I do not, I don't second this right here because it's no longer the time to act as if this is not a true thing. Mm -hmm. And we have to address it and we got to get ahead of it and we really got to bully it. You know, and bullying it not from a negative connotation, but we have to take our rightful stand. So mm-hmm. even with you guys being there at the, you know, you guys hop on things right away. And that's why Until Freedom is so important um, in all the work in our communities, because Martin Luther King is gone, unfortunately. Malcolm X is gone, unfortunately. You know, the Rosa, all these leaders that did these amazing things for us to continue to be, we have to do that work. So Mm -hmm. for me as a marketer, I wouldn't allow that to go out. I would say this is bullshit. You know what I mean? Show your face, show your heart. And that's something that we need to really be demanding of people, you know, because we have personal conversations and we say how it feels to us, but we really got to, it's, it's kind of time. We got, we got to, a lot of people, Diddy, a lot of people saying, and, and I'm reading these comments that, you know, oh, you're overreacting, you know, it's just about money. It's not racism. You people are, you know, you just um, race baiting and all these things and racism is not a thing. And this is just something like, what, what do you think? Well, here's the thing. Racism is real. It's evidence. It, 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 it's, it's in history. Like, you can't even talk to those people. That's pure ignorance. And the thing and it's is black people. There are that, black people who are tell, that are telling well, us this. Because I, it runs so deep. We've been brainwashed for so long. It's so mm-hmm. deep. It's so much deeper than what we could ever really truly unpack and unpeel. And that honestly won't happen probably for another three generations after us. The real full unpeeling because it's so deep. Like when people, you, you got, when you get the chance to go to Africa, like we mm-hmm. have, you understand mm-hmm. how deep it really, really runs. If as, I, as a young black girl, as a young inner city black girl, my first look at American history was them teaching me slavery, mm. right? Which could be where our American history started, but that's not where my history started. Mm. So imagine I didn't understand my history until in my thirties when I got a chance to go stand and look at a pyramid. Mm. You you see what I'm so understand? Yeah, this this shit the back up here, what we see is. So so deep. I saw a commercial the other day. It was, um, damn, it was like for Sonics or something. Sonics is like a, a fast food place out here. Mm-hmm. And everybody in the commercial was a fun commercial and the men had dreadlocks. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I thought like, damn, I don't never see no men in dreadlocks. Not just, not talking Jamaican. Like me, my father wears dreadlocks. He's, an Amer- he's a black American, but he has dreadlocks, long dreads. And I'm like, we don't ever see those type of depictions. Like, Right. I'm like, standing man. He's a good man. He's a clean man. Like you know, just wear his dress. And I was thinking about media and what how we really been brainwashed. You know what I'm saying? So those black people, they don't even know themselves. I was talking to one of my African friends, and he said, "You know what? Did he say I felt bad for black American women and black American men?" I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Because black American men." have an insecurity that African men don't have because they don't even know who they are. Mm. He said, I'm, I'm from Africa. Like he, and he's an Americanized African, but he's like, I know exactly where I come from, my tribe, my last name, mm. my father, my heritage, my royal, I know all of it. But it Black American difference. men, they don't even know. You don't even, you think you know, but you don't even know. It we makes know. a difference. It makes a difference. Because even Big though difference. we do know, like we were, we obviously didn't go to Africa green, right? When we arrived, we had a little bit of something with us. Not to mention that uh, attorney Angelo Pinto, who's also your brother, was with yes. us. 
and he yes. is brilliant and you know is a is our historian so we didn't show yes. up scene but still after going still. through the experience and being there learning the tribes and getting our name and going into the river and bathing in the same Oof. water which was the last place that folks who were enslaved in that area um, where they bathed before being sold off like this was an experience that you can never ever 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 replace like, there's nothing that compares to it so certainly mm -hmm. i you know I, I totally agree understand and appreciate it and I, and i want to thank you for coming um, on the show today, because you've given us so much, and there's probably we probably could break down every little piece, um, you yeah, know, and build shows out on the different things that you've done. But one thing I know is that my grandmother always said to me, "No matter what you do and how you feel, and you get up, get yourself together, pull, pull it together, pat pull it, it down, together." Put some lipstick on. That's exactly what she said. Put some lipstick on. Lipstick on. Get dressed and show up. And we, yeah. I know, because you're my friend and you're a very fashionable yeah. young lady. And I wonder over time, has that become part of what gives you joy? Is being able to make sure that when you're showing up and you're a high low person, because you'll be like, you do not need a $200 sweater. You could go right over here and get the $22.95 sweater. And then I see you in the $22.95 sweater. And I'm like, yo, that looks so damn good. So it's not about, which you also got a bunch of fly stuff. That, you know, you got it all. You are high low. But you you show up in a certain type of way. And I just want to know, where did that come from as we go out of here today? And what does it mean to you? You know, I don't think it's a part of my joy. I think it's a part of who I am. My grandparents were very, very clean cut um, people. And while all my grandparents are deceased now, um, who they are and their souls, like I, like who they are actually hit me. It's, get, like, it's not my parents as much as it is like my grandparents, you know? And I think a piece of my soul lives in that era where, you know, you do take showing up and, and getting dressed and presentation serious. As a young black girl doing business, presentation is everything to me. Mm -hmm. It's everything for my team, for what I look like, being on time, all of those, all of those things. So I take everything serious. And in that presenting, in the way I present, I take serious too, because I have to. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't be as you know, I, I believe in being buttoned up and looking buttoned up and presenting buttoned up. I think there's a there's a there's a power in that. You know what I mean? Like when you when you are buttoned up, when you show up, the things that I demand as a business person, I can only demand with showing up looking a certain way. Mm -hmm. There's no way I could demand what I demand, expect what I expect, and not take no for an answer without checking off all my boxes when it comes to showing up. So I don't think it's a part of my joy as much as a part of who I am and 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 what I value. Um, and present and, and presenting in, in the way I show up. Diddy, do you have a boyfriend, Diddy? Yeah, you got one for me because I'm that's asking, terrible. Do you have I'm one? You got another one? show. It's rough. That's another show. They terrible. Another I don't show. have no boyfriend. I'm not even dating anyone. That's the crazy part. Uh, is it? Do you think that working so Together. hard? That that's your focus. Like, are you focused? Are you like? You I'm definitely to married to the, to to my world, but I would welcome in some real shit. But I don't like none of that other stuff because then that's because I don't like wasting my time. Now I'm thinking about it, wasting my time with you, and I could be making some money. Now I'm mad. That's now right. I'm mad. Now you mad. We are mad. we are dating. We all dating. Oh yeah, we're together. together. Well, we've been together we a long together. time. We go together real <laughs> bad because we've been bad. together. We, and it's and it's many sisters out here like that. It's so many of our sisters who don't have, who, who are not even dating. So it's not just I don't have a boyfriend, but I'm also I'm not, not dating. even dating. And it's it's unfortunate that there's something about successful Black women who are assertive um, that is very difficult for us to find the right people to engage with us and for us to engage with. And I know that there's so much of a conversation around submission that we don't have the time to talk about. Today. Yeah, I need to come back on and talk yeah. about that. Talk about that. I got some and I don't think, you know, any of us have an issue with that because I certainly no. I want to be I want to be submissive and I want to be taken care of. You're and I want to what they say, what's the new thing? The soft life. 
I want to live soft this life. soft life, but it's not easy. No, and our souls, do, but our souls crave something else. That's why the soft life is tough for you and I, because <laughs> our souls crave something else. We could want a soft life, yeah. but our souls be like, "Girl, go to the go to the." But yeah, but I'm coming back to talk to you about that. Yes. Well, we thank just want you. to say thank you. We love, love you. So much. The love brilliant Miss Diddy, the greatness. Thanks. She is the best brand ambassador. She is everything. If you don't know Miss Diddy, you. please look up Miss Diddy. Follow her. She has done such amazing work and continues to evolve into this budding butterfly that she is. Thank you, bro. Miss Diddy, the brand group. Love, love you so much. Thank you for being you. with us on Street Politicians. See you soon. Yes. Yeah. Bye, baby. Love you. Diddy, I love Diddy. I call her Diddiness. You know, I just love her energy. She is, this is who she is. That right there, that interview we had is exactly who she is all the time. She's always looking to laugh. She's always going to say some real shit at the same time. And, you know, and she's professional. So, super professional. She's one of our friends that is really top tier in terms of what she does with her business. And a lot of people don't know because, you know, they, a lot of times women are just discounted anyway and things in the work that we do, but, you know, I'm sure there's, there's a lot more that she does every day that never makes it to socials. Right. But we get a chance to see her work. And one of the things that I appreciate about her being my friend is that she's extremely helpful and caring. Um, and she always is willing to step in to try to, you know, assist and provide opportunities and resources and ways that she can, you know, build up other folks. And so love her. And I, th I think it was a great interview as well. So what don't you get this week? You know, we've been talking about racism, you know, and and I really just don't get how we're at this stage, right? We're at this time, we've been to George Floyd, we're constantly going through this, that there are people who still exhibit this type of behavior. There are organizations, there are people like Sesame Street that will try to tell us that we don't see what we see. You know, they'll try to tell us that this ain't racist or this ain't that, or, you know, I really just don't get how people want us to just be quiet. Hmm. You know, how they just want us to just go and be quiet and allow the disrespect, allow the, dis allow the discrimination, allow all of these things to happen to us when history has shown what we've been dealing with. Why do yeah. people expect us to just deal with it? You know, why, why do people just expect us to be quiet and just continue to, to tolerate this level of behavior? And it's just, you know, the fact that we constantly, the fact that me and you, have a job, an organization called Until Freedom, is just terrible. That's right, that we shouldn't even have to have that. It's, it's terrible, it's, it's, it's really terrible, like that we still gotta fight for equality in a country that we damn near built, that we pretty much built, man, every day, man. So I, I really don't get that. And hopefully somebody can give me some thoughts on this. If you, if you know why people think that we're supposed <laughs> to just take racism laying down, right? We're wasting uh, your energy. Yeah, you know, wait. wasting your energy because you're gonna get a bunch of nuts. I want to know because I really want to hear. Like, we supposed to just Jalen Jalen Walker? You know, he deserved to get shot a bunch of times with no weapon, right? We we just supposed to just be. They'll quiet. say no, it was a weapon. It was in the car at one point. Weapon that, that was, was in the said. car that he got shot at while he was outside running. You know, the you weapon can that clearly was in the see car. there's no weapon on it. At the time. Really see, and we and we are supposed and we're overreacting. We're bugged out. You know, we just trying to race bait. It's not about race. You know, we 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 watch. You know, Rosita just walk by these two little black girls, and and now we see the clear other side of the video that we can see her walk by the two black girls and go to the white girl. We just supposed to be okay with it. You know, we we just want some money. You no, know, we want these things not to happen. That's right. You know, that's all we want these things not to happen. So, you know, hopefully, man, y'all can give me some insight, you know, about what, what do you think? Do y'all think racism exists? Do you think that we just race baiting? Do you think that we just need to get over it? And, you know, this, these things just happen. It's just osmosis. It happens. Like, give I, we want to get some of your input on this, this today's topic. And once again, we've come to the end of another amazing show. Shout out to Miss Diddy 
for her excellent interview. Make sure you follow Ms. Diddy. She's doing amazing things. She is continuing to evolve into one of the best, best branding experts in the world. And okay. that's the end of the show. Tamika Mallory is not going to always be wrong. My son is not going to always be right. But we will both always, and I mean always, be authentic. Thanks. Lou, Street Politicians, number one show. Number <laughs> one show. Listen to Street Politicians on the Black Effect Network on iHeartRadio. And catch us every single Wednesday for the video version of Street Politicians on iWomen.tv. 